Good evening. With the sound of recording in progress, we're ready to begin. Uh, welcome to all of the folks here in the room and also all of the ships at sea and those out in the land of Zoom. Um, except that doesn't work occasionally. There we go. Welcome to our meeting tonight. Um, simple agenda. We have a few announcements and things. We have a presentation from James Yoder on filters. And our main, uh, main speaker tonight is Tom Palakis. More than just a pretty picture uh, from more than just a pretty face. Uh, so officers and board for this year, president, uh, Woody Sims, right over there. Uh, Secretary James Yoder, manning the computers with Tom. Brooke Schofield in the back as treasurer. And our board members, Don Wrigley is at the observatory. Alex Beck uh, injured himself. Tom, playing hockey this morning. So he's one of your ilk of that. Uh, Dave Kosho is there. And Steve, I saw earlier there. Yes, there's Steve. Okay. And James is also our property director. I would remind you that we talked about it last month, but at the bottom of the homepage, there are a few things you can do. If you have not signed up for the EVAC announce uh, email list, you can do that. Just below it, you will see a loaner program. So we've got a couple of telescopes that James has refurbed that were donated to us. And then below that, you will see things for sale. And so we have bargains. Uh, no reasonable offers refused, but they're pretty well priced at this point. Uh, but yeah, contact James. Uh, he maintains the website. Uh, there are some fun things there and some nice, nice buys. And events coordinator, we're still looking. Uh, do we have any visitors tonight? Yes, come stand up and tell us who you are. And your name? Okay, thank you. Robert. Yeah, Tom, can you play with the mic? That would be good. Thank you. That would be helpful. Robert has retired. Uh, who else is a visitor this evening? One in the corner. We're going to make, we're giving Tom some exercise. Good for you. Richard Payne. Oh, Richard Payne. And Tom invited me. Palakis. Okay, Richard, thank you. Uh, the microphone didn't work, but anybody else, any other visitors? We have uh, space camp visitors, but that's okay. Uh, so thank you, welcome. We're glad that you are here tonight. Um, Brooks is in the back working on joining or renewing memberships, and he is in charge of stinking badge pickup. He has a couple of boxes of badges. Uh, if you ordered a badge, especially during the pandemonium, and we were not able to send it to you. And here's the reason. We now have the fancy magnetic version, which sticks to mailboxes and is unmailable. So sorry, we can't send it to you. We wish we could. Um, Greco's open tonight, good skies, uh, sunset to 930. We're always looking for volunteers, so if you would like to, Come contact me. Uh, mail is grco at uh, evaconline.org. Uh, and we have new white paint. Wear your sunglasses. It is brilliantly white um, and hopefully cooler. There's another thing that you notice why we call it GRCO. Gilbert Rotary Centennial Observatory is 34 press on letters twice when you have to replace them. So Greco is a much better acronym. Uh, we did receive some email that Chandler is upgrading, and we're using the term loosely, uh, their street lights using 4000K bright white light. Now we're gonna try as the club to contact some folks to see if we can encourage them to be sensible. Uh, we have a very nice paper from Woody explaining how this level of light is detrimental to wildlife. So even if they don't care about astronomers, maybe they'll care about bumblebees and bats and other critters. 
Uh, but it would be probably more effective since we have a Mesa post office box and an observatory in Gilbert. If any of you are Chandler residents, they will listen to you more if you would contact your local council member or anyone you can find. And at some point, hopefully we may give you some uh, names that you might want to contact. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, and that's, that's wonderful to know. We're not being mean to them about it. The problem is every city apparently, because 4,000K may be cheaper, I don't know, or the sales commission is higher, which is what I'm guessing, uh, but they don't know. They're just getting a bid and they are filling out paperwork based upon the things they've been told. So if they become aware that 4,000 Kelvin is harmful and that a lower number, a lower uh, level is more effective, maybe they will, you know, maybe they'll be helpful. It's nice, we don't think they're terrible people, but I think it's just a matter of them making a decision without full input. So if you can help with that, that'd be nice. Uh, I'm gonna give you a few slides on how I spent my summer vacation. Uh, I took a tour of the Grand Canyon. Uh, I didn't warn Woody. I have 137 slides. They are uniquely different, but they all look the same. And Paul Knauth is here tonight. So if you need any information about the geology of the Grand Canyon, he is the emeritus professor from uh, ASU. I would say he's our also resident fossil, but I saw Joe Goss over in the corner. So I think that that one counts. Uh, so sunset at the Grand Canyon is always gorgeous, especially when it is preceded by about three minutes of showers. So just as we were unloading one night, it started to rain. That's your favorite thing to have happen. Um, we went with Don Wrigley. We set up next to Mike Spooner. I know that Tom, some of you may know Mike. He's still doing well He's in Arizona City. I want you to look at this wonderful telescope because he is a master ma maker of telescopes. Look at the secondary cage. It is not round. It is a hexagon designed to fit neatly into the box and not move around. And because of the precise nature of it, it isn't an obstruction. It's not a problem. Mirror works fine. Uh, just a, a master design, but really unique. Um, it's also great. I don't know whether you can see those well, but the little flash of lights is a train of Starlink satellites, who, which are amazingly bright at an amazingly dark site. So everybody was going ooh and ah as these things were flying across the uh, across the field. We also went to Lowell uh, to visit their new GeoVail observing platform. Uh, it was kind of funny. Kevin Schindler was the speaker for the Grand Canyon Star Party. So we bumped into him at dinner and at the field. And then that night when Don and I were at Lowell, uh, we bumped into him again. It was like we're seeing Kevin every night. Uh, the other person in a, a, a kind of a blurry pose, but it's because he is always so excited and moves around very quickly, is Brian Skiff. Kevin Schindler is the historian of, Grand Can of Lowell. Brian Skiff is the unofficial historian. Uh, he's been there so long, he really knows where the bodies are buried. Um, we did visit the uh, Pluto astrograph, which has been beautifully restored. Uh, EVAC contributed, uh, but it's just a really, really beautiful, beautiful telescope. And the last time I was there, it was so creaky, you were afraid you were going to fall through the floor. Uh, but it's really very, very stable and fun. Uh, when Kevin was here last, he talked about Clyde Tombaugh's telescope that they purchased. Uh, it is now on display in the rotunda. Here is a close-up of the Coke can uh, covering the eyepiece and the piece of plumbing pipe to uh, move it, the cream separator and the transmission gear from the Buick uh, that's your counterweight. Uh, it's just really kind of remarkable to see it. 
we also, for Jen's benefit, because she worked hard on this, they have redone the uh, Robert Burnham uh, plaque and mounted it in a little bigger rock. It's on the uh, trail uh, in, within the solar walk. And in the, observe, in the uh, rotunda, the historical area, they have uh, his typewriter, which is pretty important because if you remember, that's what it was, the typeset, the typeface was IBM Selectric. Um, so after that, uh, James Yoder is going to talk to us about filters. And here we go. Just advance and you should be in business. Hi, hey guys. Uh, so my talk is supposed to be about filters tonight. And I thought I would do a quick little 10-minute uh, thing on it. And I started doing research on it. This is visual filters for observing uh, deep sky objects specifically. Uh, as I did the research for it, uh, my little three-page project turned out to be more like 20 pages. So uh, instead of doing that whole thing in one thing, I'm going to break it up into two talks. Uh, we'll do part of it this month, and then next month do another part of it. Um, this month we're going to focus on, on the concepts of what you need to know to be able to talk about filters. Uh, also, let me get here. Uh, if you want to look at the full 20-page paper that I put together. A little closer. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, if you want to see more details on uh, the paper and everything, there's a short URL for it. Uh, go ahead and check that out. And there's all the information I gathered there. Uh, you can also email me at that website or that address if you want to have any questions. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so the basic concepts we're going to try to cover today is exit pupil, knowing your pupil size and highest useful magnification for deep sky objects and types of deep sky objects. So again, a lot of you already know this concepts and everything, but you need to understand them before we can go on. And actually, I learned a bit of information on this as I was researching it myself. So what's the exit pupil? Uh, if you take a look, let me see if I can get the drawing here. Uh, you can't see that here. I don't know how you get the laser pointer working on this. Yeah. You sure it is. Okay, thank you. So if you look at this diagram, this is you know representative of the aperture of the telescope coming in, and then your eyepiece here, and then you look at this little cone of light that's coming out of the eyepiece is what's called the exit pupil, and the diameter of that cone of light is what we're interested in. Um, so that's the exit pupil. Uh, that is defined here, and forgive me on the equations, I don't think I'm using standard notation on that necessarily, but I'm, I'm more concerned with the concepts. So the exit pupil is defined as uh, the focal length of the eyepiece divided by the focal ratio of the telescope. So let's take an example of that. So if we have an F10 telescope with a 40 millimeter eyepiece, 40 divided by 10 is 4 millimeters. So the exit pupil for that system is 4 millimeters. Uh, another example of the same type of thing is a F5 telescope with the 20 millimeter eyepiece would have the same exit pupil on that. Now, why is exit pupil important? And we'll talk about that, and that kind of goes into the next scene, is you're looking in the system. You want to make sure that there's not a lot of light spilling out and not going into your pupil. So we need to know what your pupil size is to try to basically match them up so you're getting as much light out of the telescope as you can get. So how do we know what your or your pupil size is? Well, you can either go to the doctor and ask him to take a look at it, but there's also another a couple different techniques that you can do uh, yourself. And this is probably the preferable method because you want to go to the site that you're going to be doing the observing at because some sites are darker than others. So your, your pupil is going to be larger or smaller. And uh, check it out for yourself. Now, you used to be able to go and get uh, these pupil gauges here and test them out for yourself, but uh, I got this as Sky and Telescope like 20 years ago, and you can't get them anymore. <laughs> so uh, there's a hack for that, and there's a reference to where I got this information at, the book. Uh, basically, what you do is you get a, a metric Allen wrench and start on the smallest size Allen wrench and put it right up to your eyes and look at a star, and uh, you should be able to split this. The star will be split in two, uh, and then go to the next size and keep on doing it until the, the star is on either on one side of the Allen wrench or the other side. That's the size of your pupil. Now, unfortunately, there's no 4.5 uh, Allen wrenches that you can get easily, so you're only going to get within a millimeter. But that should be pretty close anyway. 
Um, you can also see that as you get older, uh, your pupil gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the, the maximum size of your pupil. So that's a disadvantage for us older people, right? Uh, but that's the way life, life goes. <laughs> So, so now you know how to measure your pupil size, and now you know about the exit pupil, so you should be able to match up between the two. Now, you don't need to have an exact match, because if you had an exact match between the exit pupil and your eye, you'd have to have your, your head perfectly matched there. And unless you like get a clamp on your head to the telescope, that's not going to work too well. So you'll want a little larger uh, exit pupil. Uh, so that kind of goes also into the next thing that we need to think about is the highest useful magnification. And the way I think about this is it's uh, you want to magnify objects to see as much detail as you can get. But the more you magnify something, especially if it's a extended object like a globular cluster or a galaxy or something like that, uh, it gets dimmer and dimmer, dimmer as your magnification goes up. So there is a paper, and I think this is general consensus about what is the highest useful magnification for different types of objects. Um, so if you look at the stars, these are one point, you know, single point objects, you can go very high, uh, 60 times magnification, or 60 times uh, your aperture size. So that's what this times is on the left, uh, the right hand side of the table. It's 20, like the first one's uh, multiple star systems is 25 to 60. That'd be 25 times your aperture size in inches uh, to 60 times your ap aperture size in ideal you know, conditions. Uh, planets is the same because they're very bright. Uh, but then if you get to globular clusters and small nebula and stuff like that, you can see it, it starts dropping down to 25 to 15 as a recommended uh, starting point. Now, everyone's going to have different you know, situations for your own uh, set up in your own preferences, but this is a good place to kind of start at. Uh, if you also look at galaxies and large nebula, 8 to 15, and that's because they can be rather extended and also dimmer. And when we're talking about dimmer objects, we need to also consider the background of what your object is viewing at, and that's where the darkness of the sky is really important. We're talking about contrast. Uh, and that's what these are trying to do is get the best uh, trade-off between good contrast and seeing details. That's what we're trying to get. And then smaller galaxies and nebulas, 15 to 20. Now, if we take, oh, I'm running out of time, so I better speed up a little bit. If we take an ideal situation between a lot of those things, again, we're interested in the deep sky objects. 15 seems to be kind of constant along those. So what I did was I took 15 and tried to figure out uh, how do you figure out what eyepiece is ideal for your system. All you need to know is your focal ratio of your telescope times 1.7 and that's the ideal size if you were going at 15 times for your thing but this is kind of interesting because it's the focal ratio so i've got two celestrons uh sets and they're both f10 right one of them is a six inch and one of them is a 11 inch i'm going to use the same eyepiece for both of those now the magnif magnification is going to be different on each one of them but one of them but the recommended eyepiece you're going to use is going to be the same. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, why are these things important? Again, what we're trying to do is optimize the situation where we are, have the best chance of viewing an object. Uh, getting a good match between your exit pupil or, and your pupil size is going to help make sure you get as much light in, in there as you can. Also, the highest uh, useful magnification is going to be a good starting point to compromise between magnifying something so you can see it, but also having it uh, contrast enough so you can pick it out from the background. Um, while we're talking about that stuff, let's just go ahead and recap some of the best practices when you're doing visual observations. First, you want to make sure your eyes are dark, dark adapt. So give yourself 30 minutes uh, to fully adjust to the darkness. Pick as a dark sight as you can get because that's really going to be one of the most important things. Optimize your equipment. Make sure that your equipment's collimated and optics are clean. Uh, use averted vision when you can. If you guys aren't familiar with that, what averted vision is, instead of looking at that dim object directly, you look off to the side of the field of view and you can actually probably see more details that way because you're, uh, is it the rods or the cones? I always get them confusing. Uh, the rods are more sensitive than your cones, and the cones are in the middle of your eye. Um, also, get the proper magnification uh, that we talked about some already. And I found also getting the magnification to the where the background is almost completely black, but not quite. 
that's where you're getting good contrast. So you work those two things together. Also take your time. Uh, take at least three to five minutes to look at things because atmospheres change as you're watching things and you'll pick up more details. Uh, and this is more pertinent to the next presentation next month is use the proper filter. We'll talk about that next month. Also, you can use a blink technique for looking for lo uh, locating planetary nebula, which we'll talk about next month also. Uh, so that's where we'll stop at for now. I want to thank both Toms for helping me putting this together and checking the accuracy of it and my wife Laura for checking the spelling and everything. Uh, and next month, this is what we'll cover, uh, discussion of the deep sky objects, uh, what, what does a filter do, and types of, oops, types of filters, and uh, filters and exit pupil. This is where we're talking about some of the concepts we've covered, and some, fil some uh, filters currently available. So that's my presentation, and any questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just curious, uh, does that formula for exit pupil work across all eyepiece designs, like orthoscopic? Yeah, versus... that's a good question. There's probably someone here that would know more about that. As far as I could see, there was it does work across designs. Yeah, I didn't see any distinction. So yes, good question. Pardon? Yeah. Yeah, all yeah. these are okay, rule of thumb. These are starting points, right? Yeah. Good question. Okay, thank you. Okay. That was great. Thank you, James. And we'll uh, look forward to part two. Oh, this was, and you get a sneak peek because <laughs> I copied them all. All right. So now, Woody, if you would like to introduce our speaker, uh, it's easy if you, it, it, you know you have a famous astronomer, if you type their name in and you click on images and you see uh, their picture as well as pictures they have taken. So this is one of uh, the pictures from Tom and Chen. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our main speaker tonight, Tom Polakis. Uh, he gave me some pointers on how to introduce him, so let me see if I can do this correctly. The one and only, did you get that? The one and only, the legendary, Tom Palakis. Everywhere I give a talk is it's a long A, Palakis, not Palakis, not Palakis, but I know that's how it goes. So yeah, it's really nice. Um, a lot of my favorite uh, speak, uh, my favorite amateur astronomers are in the room, um, and Woody. And so let's move on to the, the talk here. So you can read the slide. So my timer starts at 8.15. Um, and what we're going to look at are really simple math uh, problems that'll take us out to the object, show us what the effects are, of color are, and not just look at the perfection of the image, and they're not perfect, um, looking at what there is to see in them. So a lot of this is just kind of putting things in terms we can understand. So. How much does a baby elephant weigh anyway? Um, so I'm only gonna give this one slide where I lecture about technique and imaging, what I think images should have. Um, you shouldn't image objects when they're near the horizons, which is probably obvious, but try to, try to make sure they're at least 30 degrees above the horizon and 45 if possible. Um, you can see the background here. Here's black, if you're doing a black and white image. It should be light gray. The, the sky at the darkest places in the world is light gray, medium gray. It's not inky black. And the inky black presentation hides. It obscures a lot of detail in images. Um, try to keep the color saturation down and make snarky comments like that. Um, always image with north up. And a lot of people who do aesthetic images don't agree with this, but north up, east to the left. And that way, if you say, I think I found a supernova in the image, I think I found something, it's easy to have all the reference images, every science image ever taken has north up, east to the left, or a note that says in this special case, it's not. Um, good to give you angular size, say what's the field of view of this image, 20 by 10 arc minutes, that kind of thing, or say what the image scale is in arc seconds per pixel. Um, and. Captions are nice too, just something to 
And that's kind of what this whole talk is about, is like a caption, no fakery. So we'll start, and I'm gonna introduce each one of these with a slide like this, and we'll start with the atmosphere. Um, what is there to see in the atmosphere, and how is it affecting astronomy? So three years ago now, um, we had in 2010, we had the worst of the California wildfires fires so far, and we had red sunsets. And we had that also just a week or two ago in the upper Midwest and in the Northeast from, Cal from Canada's wildfires. And there's a lot to see in that. So the reason that the sky is blue is just blue light scatters more. You just saw 20 minutes ago using these really blue LED lights is the worst thing for light pollution because that scatters more. So, and this isn't just here on earth, it's not lights, it's also all the way across the universe. As you go to longer wavelengths, you'll get less scattered light and you'll it's more transparent. So, <clears throat> all right, and that's also why you get red sunsets. Obviously, as you're going through more and more atmosphere, you're gonna have just the red get, get through and all the blue wavelengths, the shorter wavelengths are just gonna be absorbed and scattered. So what I like to say is if you don't have a clear sky, sometimes there's really cool stuff to look at. And this is not a lecture about atmospheric physics, but here's a 22 degree halo and a circumscribed halo and really cool a power helix circle all happening at the same time. If you wanna know about this, if you see something in the sky, uh, there's a person in the UK named Les Cowley, and that's the far and away the best site for telling you what all these different things are, all these halos, uh, cirrus cloud ha uh, halos, parhelia, um, ice crystal and, and water droplet phenomena. So there's all these cool stuff to look at in the sky. And when you go outside, it's nice to just instinctively look up and see what's going on. Um, way up in the atmosphere, 50 miles, 60 miles is air glow. And as we go through these solar maxima, uh, we see a lot of it. So this is actually from 2012. We're out uh, in Southern Utah for a solar, for a annular eclipse of the sun. And we saw these kind of green bands going across the sky. Let's see if I can get the laser, yeah. So people on Zoom aren't gonna see the laser, but that's how it goes. So these bands are, what happens during the day is these molecules in the upper atmosphere are kind of storing up the energy of sunlight and it's, it's, I think it's called electroluminescence, and then it releases that energy at night. And so this is a real subtle example of that, and hopefully these are gonna animate okay. Here's some not so subtle examples of air glow um, that's happening from Anderson Mesa, where I was stationed for about half of the nights in the last three months of last year observing Didymus. So I just put a fisheye lens and let it rip for a couple hours and, um, and then this is quite a bit sped up. So when you have this green color, you can actually see that naked eye. You'll see strips of light going across. The orange is not visible at all. So you really have to have a keen eye to see this at all um, with the naked eye, but the camera picks it up great. Another example of air glow, and here's more of that orange colored air glow. Um, so this is brightening up the sky um, by several tenths of a magnitude, which is a lot um, every time you go through a solar maximum. So we'll have to kind of, it's not a terrible thing, but we'll have to live for, through this for the next few years as we go through this maximum. Another thing in the atmosphere to look for is crepuscular rays. Uh, I've always liked these uh, converging uh, rays, which are just an illusion because you're thinking that the uh, sun is got to be at the point right there. And it's just cloud shadows that we're seeing. But what's cool is once in a while, if you set at a window seat in an airplane, you'll see this and they're not converging at all. And you can see that they're just parallel, just cloud shadows. And so there'll be more of that in this talk. And here's another example. So converging rays, this is over uh, lower Lake Mary, which actually filled up with water this last winter for the first time in decades um, and this was back when it was dry a couple of years ago and you'll just see these cloud shadows as they're kind of like star trails but they appear to be a diverging as as the clouds pass overhead um, 
one of the problems we deal with in uh, with having an atmosphere. I mean, everything about astronomy is worse because we have an atmosphere overhead. Of course, it allows us to live and breathe, but the space telescopes have way more advantages than just um, having a clearer sky because the atmosphere is mucking everything up. And so one thing it's doing in this case, I put the zenith up in this image of Mars that I took actually with the Clark refractor at Lowell, not a great image or anything, but it shows I did not have a dispersion corrector. This is with Mars 60 degrees above the horizon. There's a red rim there and a blue rim there. And that's because the uh, wavelengths are refracted differently. Red, red uh, light is refracted less than blue light. So Pink Floyd's dark side of the moon had it right. So that's uh, physically correct to have the red light refracted less than purple. And what this also does is creates the green flash, which I think everybody's heard of. This is over Lake Michigan from my hometown. Um, and you can see that green flash is sort of a misnomer, but in those last uh, couple seconds, the last sliver of the sun turns green. And uh, I think the best way to explain this is the same way that I explain what's going on with Mars and just make a still frame. And that's all you're seeing. You're just seeing a uh, green upper limb and the red limb on the bottom, of course, is below the horizon. Uh, it would be a blue flash, but but for that same reason of scattering, um, you, you don't normally have a transparent enough sky for that blue light to get through. There's an imager down in Tucson named Robert Sparks, who's on Facebook all the time, posting his great images of blue flashes, because there you do have the transparent enough sky. Um, that's it's really cool, these, these uh, videos that Robert's been doing. <clears throat> so let's move on to um, landscapes. We've gone kind of through the atmosphere, and we'll work our way out into the universe with this talk. So star trails are the most basic form of, of imaging. Before, what we used to do is leave the camera on bulb shutter and leave it open for an hour or two, and you can't do that with digital cameras. So now, just take a bunch of 30-second exposures and then have software string them together. So what you can see in star trails, Polaris is right there. And since this is a wide angle lens, these are not circular, everything's a little bit distorted in the corners. There's the celestial equator. So when you look at star trails, you kind of tell where you're looking in the sky. This is the rising sky pointing east toward the 24 inch dome at, at Anderson Mesa. And what you can also know from star trails is that they will, their angle to the horizon, at least at the celestial equator, will be 90 degrees minus your latitude. So if you go on up to a Iceland or Alaska, these trails at the equator are just gonna be going like that. And of course at the equator, they'd be straight up. <clears throat> Another star trails, and this is from uh, the Holvater site, sometimes called the antenna site. Um, and that's uh, the star Canopus right there as it's just crossed the meridian. Um, you know that you're pointing south, due south at the meridian in this case, because that's where the star trails are gonna be perfectly level like that. Um, so how high does, a, does a, any astronomical object get is real easy math. So you just, when it's on the meridian, when it's on its highest, you take 90 degrees minus your latitude and you add the declination. So for Canopus, it'll get about four degrees above the horizon. And I, I'm, I do that math all the time when I'm thinking what's the declination and how high is it gonna get at my observatory, which unfortunately has cables to the south that I want to avoid. Um, one of the things that's cool is you can go back with uh, software or with the planetarium app in this case for the phone and figure out when and where a picture was taken. So we did quite a few nighttime hikes to the Grand Canyon under the full moon. And when you're out, out of the shadows, you don't even need a headlamp or, or a flashlight at all. You just hike along the trail and it, you're dark adapted and it's like day. Um, so on the way back up the Kaibab Trail in this case, um, we're most of the way back up. And then I turned around and saw this site and thought, man, this is cool, this has to be photographed and pulled out the tripod and the camera and everything. And so there's the Hyades and the Pleiades and a couple planets, and I was kind of able to figure out that's exactly the scene that you have. 
So it's kind of cool to be able to go back and take anybody's astro photo that has a landscape and be able to reconstruct the scene. And what this also does, and this is just going to get worse with artificial intelligence, it allows you to easily debunk photographs that have a fake moon pasted in at the wrong angle and the constellations all cockeyed. So it makes that quite easy as well. Um, the moon illusion is described as the moon appears larger when it's near the horizon. It seems like it's a, a bigger angle when it's at the horizon. Um, and I've never seen a good explanation for that because they've said it's because you compare it to the objects in the foreground. If you have a, a flat horizon, an ocean horizon, the moon still looks way bigger. And if you go to the Southern hemisphere and you look at the constellation Corvus or Scorpius when they're at the zenith, they look like they're that big compared to what we get in Arizona. So it works in the other direction as well. And this is a different sort of moon illusion where I went out, to, I wanted to get the crescent going behind the South Mountain Towers. And so here's the moon setting. And when I look at this, and I think I got confirmation from enough people, these sure look like diverging lines, right? And I don't, I mean, we're looking, we're not even looking at a real scene, we're just looking at a photograph up on the screen and it looks like they're diverging. But those don't look like they're diverging. So, all right, good. So everybody sees this. Man, I was really worried about that. So is, there, is that better or worse? So yeah, why does that happen? It's a, it's a new moon illusion and I can't explain it, but I know I should be able to explain that. And there's another uh, thing that I found. This is a stratovolcano named uh, Likan Kabur. It's a real tall volcano. It's up above 20,000 feet in the Andes. And when Jennifer and I went to uh, Chile, this was out our, our window of our casita. And, um, and then the moon set kind of differently from Chile than what I thought it would. And so I just want this, wanted to just show this to you here. That's how the moon sets. So this was a Jennifer suggestion. And then you don't know how much work that was to do that on Photoshop. <laughs> okay, so we'll watch it twice then. All right, um, so Diacolite is really cool. And Richard Payne in the corner just, just got back from Namibia in the Southern Hemisphere and showed a, a couple of his images that are just terrific, and including one of those at Diacolite. This one I decided to just it look the best just presented as a grayscale image rather than in color. This is in the good direction from Anderson Mesa, nine air miles south of Flagstaff and only several tenths of a magnitude brighter than the natural sky brightness at the darkest places in the world. So, so there's still good places to observe and east is the real good direction. There are light domes along the horizon. Um, so zodiacal light is just uh, all this dust in the plane of our solar system and it's backlit. So back when everybody used to smoke cigarettes and that was a cool thing to do in the movies, you would see backlighting of the smoke and it would be glowing real brightly. And that's all that's happening with the zodiacal light. And here, they always talk about the ecliptic, the plane of our solar system. And here you can see it's real steep to the horizon. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. In fact, on this slide. So my way to visualize that is in September in the morning, the, the zodiacal light will be real favorable and September in the evening, it's going to be flat to the horizon. So here is September before sunrise and the earth not to scale. Um, and here we are in Arizona and you can see that we are kind of leaning into the ecliptic. So that's kind of the, the way I visualize that. That would be at the September equinox and, and we'll have the best view. And as you go around the other side in the morning, we're going to have the worst view. And then the opposite happens in March you have a great view in the evening instead of in the morning, and then the ecliptic's more flat. And that affects all the, the zodiacal light and the two inner planets, the um, Mercury and Venus, how high are they in the sky? So I talked about zodiacal light. There's also the zodiacal band. And here I'm gonna say another non-complaining thing about light pollution. This is from Vicol Road, which is 45 miles due south of downtown Phoenix. And even from there, if you look you know, in the right direction, especially, 
you can see the zodiacal band going across the sky. So zodiacal light is the brightest because it's backlit. Um, the zodiacal band, as you get away from the sun more, the lighting is not as favorable. And then not very visible is called the gegenschein, which is exactly opposite the sun. The gegenschein is cool if you're at a dark enough site and it's not behind the Milky Way or in front of the Milky Way, I should say, you can kind of tell time by the gegenschein if you know the cardinal directions. You can tell when it's midnight or two in the morning kind of thing. Um, let's move on to uh, solar system pictures as we're moving out into the uh, universe farther and farther. Um, I took uh, a lot of hydrogen alpha images of the sun that show prominences. I mean, that's the real pricey filter that does all the cool stuff. But you can get a reasonably priced uh, white light filter for any telescope and you can get them for under $100. This was done with a, a wedge that Lunt sells. And the Wilson effect is, uh, I didn't really know about it until I looked at my own photo, my own image. And you can kind of see how the umbra of a sunspot, the black part, is actually sunk deeper. And this was discovered way back in the 18th century. And it's only you know, on a scale where the sun is 800,000 miles across in diameter. It's only a 400 miles or so depth. And there's actually kind of a conical profile of the umbra of a sunspot. And you only really get this when it's coming around near the limb, like it is here. Um, the Earth isn't really there, that's for scale. Um, so let's look at a couple of prominences. I think I have the wrong slide here, but I'll show it anyway. This is not really an eruptive prominence. What I was going to talk about was if you see a prominence that's way huge, these huge prominences that's way above the sun's surface, get everybody out to look at it right away or get your camera on there right away because it's not going to last long. So whenever you see a sun, like we see a little bit of that, that'll be really transient because that has reached escape velocity and that's just gonna take off. But these kind of looping prominences that I'm showing in this slide and in the next one, oops, and in that one, um, those can stay stable for hours. So this phenomenon is called the coronal rain, which I won't attempt to explain here, but it's, it's fascinating. You have this, uh, these uh, streamers of prominence that they just get, they, they get hung up in the magnetic field lines and this all do this looping motion and kind of fall back toward the sun. This was my eruptive prominence shot. I just forgot to delete the other slide. And this is only about a half an hour. And within an hour or so, that thing's gone. And so the giant prominences, look at them right away. Or whoever wants to, whoever you can bring out to look at them, they're spectacular, but they don't last. So the easiest thing to do with uh, solar imaging is just to take full disk shots. And uh, this just compares perihelion and aphelion. So the sun is actually about 2% closer in January than it is in July. So, so the sun is farther away now. So that explains why Phoenix is only like 110 degrees instead of 115 degrees. So we have that going for us. Um, on to meteors, we're working our way. We're kind of backing up. We're, we're in the atmosphere again, 100 miles away, 60 miles away, which is where the meteors are. Um, and just look at some things you can observe with meteors in photographs. You'll almost always see this green color and then it doesn't show up great on the screen, but it's a little bit more yellowish orange as you go to the right side. And those two elements are magnesium and sodium. There are other colors that you'll see along um, the train of a, the trail of the meteor without having to do any kind of spectroscopy or anything. And so meteor colors are really interesting and they're revealing what's the uh, color, the ionized color of the atmosphere of those elements and of the meteor, of meteoroid itself. I talked about convergence, like these rays are not parallel. Meteor showers, so when you looked at crepuscular rays, meteor showers do the same thing, um, where they all appear to trace back to a radiant. This one does, does not really because it was half hour later, um, but the radiant in this case is up near uh, Castor and Pollux and Gemini. Um, again, it's just the same phenomenon that you're heading through this parallel stream 
and they just appear to be coming away from you. Well, I wanted to know more about radiance of meteors. So I went to this, this great site that's just called the Small Bodies site at JPL, and it'll let you plot orbits and the current position of everything in the solar system, including the parent bodies of uh, meteor showers. So here's the parent body of the Geminids is kind of a dead comet. It's an asteroid called 3200 Phaethon. And you can see what's happening here is the, the stream that's creating the meteors that intersects with the Earth's orbit is coming in from the backside. So then you know you're going to get slow meteors in that case. And you can even, if you're really nerd, you can do vector sum of the Earth and that motion, knowing those two velocities and figure out where the radian is. In the case of the Perseids, um, you know, Perseus is nowhere near the ecliptic. It's way up north and you know, in Perseus uh, near the double cluster. And here we have this stream that's coming in kind of from the top like that. Um, so what we have with the Perseids is a period of 133 years. So you had, so this last perihelion, which was 20 years ago, or sorry, 30 years ago, you actually had a little bit of an enhancement in the activity. In the Leonids, every 33 years, you get this huge peak of activity because this is a young and fresh comet with a lot of debris in its stream. And so when Comet Temple Tuttle comes around, as it did in 1999, we had several years in a row of spectacular uh, meteor activity. But just by going to this site and visualizing things, you can see why a meteor shower does what it does. This tube or this torus of, of, of a debris stream just intersects our orbit just right. And that's why most comets that we see don't create meteor showers, because that's quite a coincidence for that to actually come through and intersect our orbit the way it does. <clears throat> so when I was in Namibia way back in 2004, um, I was there during the Perseids. I thought, cool, it's a dark site. Um, I'm at 25 degrees south, and I'm going to go look at, a, at the Perseid meteor shower. So there's Cassiopeia, and this is looking almost due north, and there's the radiant. I sat out there for an hour, and I saw exactly zero Perseid meteors on the peak on August, in the night of August 11th. And then you looked at what the reason for that is, this isn't like an astronomical object that's off at infinity. It's only 60 miles up in the atmosphere. So almost all of the meteors are happening down there. That radiance, just an illusion that it's that far away. Um, so it was just kind of a learning experience, learning the hard way. But I could think of worse places to be than out in the sand dunes and seeing the night sky the way it was there. Um, also with meteors, uh, I hear these called smoke trails. They're not smoke, all right? So it's, it's a ionized gas, and it's really cool to watch these things happen. So here is one meteor in a shower that happened uh, at the end of last May, May 2022, and you can see this happening. So I'll have a closer view of that, and it stays stable for like a half an hour sometimes. So here's that meteor, and here's this train going away. And these upper, these upper atmospheric winds are going a couple hundred miles an hour, pushing this train down. But look for these next time that you're looking at for a meteor shower. And if you see a hint of one, then you can point, a binoc point binoculars at it. And you'll follow these things for, you know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes kind of thing. Um, so we've gone into meteors and now we're going to go into near earth objects and i'm going to define satellites as near earth objects as well my buddy uh jf goot who is in at mississippi state university he was in phoenix here for just a couple of years at asu um, he's a biologist and he lives over in starkville and he had the idea that we have a nice baseline we're 1300 miles apart at about the same latitude Let's, uh, let's go watch this uh, near-Earth object, and we'll both image it. And it's Mississippi, so he had clouds, and I didn't here in Arizona. But these are our trails of this near-Earth object. So that was about 750,000 miles away, and parallax worked out perfectly, uh, five minutes. And from that parallax, just from measuring from the image, JF was able to calculate the, 
distance out to the near Earth uh, asteroid within a couple percent. So even just on the surface of the Earth, um, you'll find that there's quite a bit of parallax. So when you have one of these real near, near Earth asteroids that comes like a couple times as far away as the moon, um, you can't use an ephemeris, um, a list of the coordinates for the center of the Earth. You actually have to take into consideration where are you on the Earth. So you actually have to say, I'm at my backyard in Tempe, Arizona, or you're going to get it way wrong. <clears throat> so geostationary or satellites um, from our latitude, probably most people have seen this, that you'll be viewing the Orion Nebula or photographing imaging the Orion Nebula and these trails will be going across it, um, which is because from our latitude at 33 degrees north, um, that's right where they go, negative five and a half degrees declination. Um, if you go up to you know, near the Canadian border, now that moves down to seven degrees. So it depends on your position in the Earth, on the Earth. <clears throat> so again, with the satellites, here's uh, International Space Station over Greco, which is not far away from here, a short walk from here. Um, I love doing these short exposures, like don't, don't do one long exposure, do a bunch of short exposures. And what they show is when it's nearly overhead are these long trails, and then you get a nice perspective as it's going off into the distance, you know, and as it started. And what I also like is that an app that costs almost nothing for your phone, um, I use Orbitrack, but there are many others, uh, will tell you where that satellite was during that image. So it started off the coast of northern Baja, and that last bit right there when it's over in the east is up in Kansas, Nebraska. And it's doing all of that in five minutes. So it's too bad we can't fly that fast in airplanes, but that's how it is. Talked a bit about parallax. I think there's parallax beaten into the ground in this talk. Um, here's the James Webb Space Telescope um, from not long after it was launched. I think about a month or so after it was launched early in 2022. And two hours, it did this. So not only that's not really the, the Webb Telescope's motion as much as it's the Earth's rotation. So during those two hours, our rotation changes the perspective and makes it appear to go across the frame. Well, it does go across the frame. What you also see is this last image here is how bright it got. So there was constant changing of the light as we're catching glints off of solar panels and off, not really a sol solar panel, but the big sun shield that's on it. And it does that still. If you take a set of exposures, it's varying by two or three magnitudes all over the place. So finally, we can move into the real solar system stuff with the moon. And here's the lunar limb. And back in the 50s, there were science fiction movies before we had really gone out and sent any craft out to the moon. And they always had these sharp peaks that look like the Grand Tetons or something. And, and then you go back to an image that you could easily take from the Earth, and they could take images this high resolution back then. And you can see that's not the case at all. The angle of repose on the moon on all of this on the regolith is 40 degrees or so or less. So you don't really have those peaks. So it means that science fiction was lying to us. And I'm really disappointed that Catwoman on the moon was not more accurate than it was. Um, not images. In this case, this is just using. Uh, Lunar Atlas Pro, I think it's called, and showing libration, but it is relevant to the next slides. <clears throat> so because the moon is not in a perfectly circular orbit, and also due to our parallax, due to our, due to our rotation, you're seeing this constantly shifting view of the moon. You don't get just, you get one face of the moon, but you actually get to see 59% of its surface. And What's really cool was William K. Hartman, a uh, legendary U of A astronomer geologist, um, before they knew about the Oriental Basin, before the Soviets had gone to the backside of the moon, they did some experience experiments, he and Gerald Kuiper, Gerard Kuiper, sorry, um, to infer 
that there's this big basin that the Oriental Basin is on the back side of the moon. Um, so using moon map uh, software, there's the Oriental Basin and then using that same software shows you what it looks like. And now here's my image of the Oriental Basin when the moon was real favorably librated so that you could see the basin from here. And so that crater is that one. And if that's the case, that's one of the rings right there. There's another one and there's the other one at that innermost ring. So you can see part of that. And Hartman and Kuiper were smart enough to actually be able to figure that out, the globe and cameras, that kind of thing, and able to figure out that that thing was back there before it was even discovered by the Soviet uh, orbiter three years later, which is pretty cool. Smart guys. Something to go out and look for in two weeks. Um, it's going to be even better than the one we had last year. This is from 2022 um, from the site known as the roof of my house in Tempe. Um, I just set up the, the, the camera with a wide angle lens on the roof and just took images every two minutes, I think it was, moves its own diameter a um, minute. And the, the moon is way south right now. And, and then it also goes way north. So the sun goes from 23 degrees north of the equator to 23 degrees south of the equator. These are celestial equator. Um, in the case of the moon, since it's inclined, its orbit is inclined five degrees, it can go as high as over 28 degrees north. And you'll see that these days where when the moon is up north, like Gemini, it's like almost straight overhead. And it looks really strange to me when it rises or when it's at this low declination. <clears throat> Here's uh, how far the sun is on the winter solstice. And then you go almost five degrees south of that, and that's where the where the moon is. And so next month in July, it's got to be about two weeks from now, right? Or about at new moon. <clears throat> Take a look at where the moon rises if you know your cardinal directions, and then go out at midnight and look at the moon. And it's way down in the dirt. It's, it's interesting. So you can go online. I'm not going to go through this at all. It's called the lunar standstill, which is an odd term. But that's what you could Google, and it'll explain kind of the geometry of why the moon is doing this. So every 18 years, 18 and a half years, there's a cycle of that five degree inclination kind of rotating like that. So right now it's favorable to have these extreme north and south moons. Um, when I took this Earthshine photo, again from Anderson Mesa under real clear skies, uh, one of the things to know about Earthshine is that. If you were standing on the moon and looking back at the Earth, the phase of the Earth is just going to be the opposite of the phase of the sun or a phase of the moon. So you're going to get a gibbous Earth with that phase if you look back at the Earth. Now I was kind of curious if you were on the moon and you were getting moonshine, so a reflection of the full moon back on the Earth, how bright would that be? And so I Googled around. And then all I could, I tried to find moonshine and then that's all I could find. So, all right. Here's a star of the show, Cruz Navarro, my grandson. He's looking, wondering, why is my picture up on the screen? Oh, he's gonna come out and look at, there he is. So in his NASA astronaut suit. Um, so this is my lead in photograph for planets and other grandson Lincoln doesn't get his photo in his presentation, sorry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so phases of Venus. So right after I retired, and I was more ambitious than I am seven years after I retired now, um, I went out during the daytime, all of these are daytime images of planet Venus going through uh, inferior conjunction. And so not a lot of work in terms of photography is concerned and going out and doing the imaging but a lot of having to stick to it and make sure that you're out there every week or so taking these images. So in this case, we definitely did not have a transit of Venus going across the face of the sun as we did in 2004 and 2012, but we had this thing where we got a real thin crescent and it kind of went that way. And so the way I see that, and this is probably the better view of it, is the earth is here and Venus, just like the moon is not in the plane of the solar, in the plane of the Earth's orbit, 
passes pretty far above or below the sun when it goes through inferior conjunction. So the lighting from the sun is just going to create this real thin crescent like you have right there. <clears throat> I wouldn't recommend imaging Venus when it's this close to the sun. So two days before inferior conjunction, mainly what I wanted to show, and this is really noisy after a lot of noise reduction um, because the contrast is extremely low, um, is uh, that the crescent Venus doesn't do what the crescent moon does because it has an atmosphere. So the moon can only have that lighting where the crescent goes halfway around because it's solid, it doesn't have any atmosphere to speak of. And in Venus, you'll get that kind of thing. There are other images out there, better images on the web um, by the master Terry Lejeune in, in France that show this going all the way around. Um, this, the, these rings, that ringing is just an artifact. That's not a real thing, but the other part is real. So pretty cool. And that's uh, when the moon, when the Venus is within only several degrees of the sun. And I wouldn't, I'm not responsible for anybody else who decides to do that. I'll put it that way. All right, Venus setting behind Kitt Peak. Um, Dean Kettleson started doing this. And then Dean and I started having discussions. Jennifer and Dean and I went down to a site on the road that takes you to Sasabi, Mexico, and uh, imaged Venus going behind the, the objective was to get it to go behind the four meter telescope, the male telescope dome. Um, and so we did a lot of Google Earth thing and figuring out a little bit of math and finesse with, with uh, trigonometry and that to try to figure out where's the best site to do this. Um, but one of the things, is it on this slide or not? There we go. So one of the things that I mentioned way early in the talk about is was called image scale. And that's just what angle corresponds to a pixel. And it's a real simple equation. It's actually 206.25 times your pixel size in microns divided by your focal length. So with my Canon 6D, I have four arc seconds per pixel at the 300 millimeter telephoto. Venus is 12 pixels. So I should be able to get a decent resolution on, on um, yeah, Venus is actually 60 arc seconds or so. So I can get 12 pixels and that's gonna be enough to show the crescent of Venus. So here's a time-lapse of it setting behind the four meter dome, which was so cool. And, and one of my favorite parts is you'll see it come out right here. And this is sped way up. We saw that, Dean and I were set up right next to each other, saw that for about four or five seconds. Jennifer was like 100 feet to the north of us and said, oh, look, the crescent. And then she was able to watch it for 20 seconds, 30 seconds, for a lot longer period of time. So Parallax, again, our friend. <clears throat> um, people ask me, when, did, when, is it, when should you look at Mars? And the answer, sadly, is that every two years, it's good for about two or three months. And then it's and then it's what it is now, five arc seconds, and you just can't see anything on it. So even just uh, in this short period of time between these two images, you know, five months, it's gone from favorable full phase, 22 arc seconds, to this kind of sad seven arc seconds and beyond the range of what my seeing is gonna show for a good image. <clears throat> but I, th I had to make this plot, um, X engineer that I am, so. Um, plot's real simple to understand. This is 50 years going from 2000 to the year 2050. And it's just the angular size of Venus using ephemeris generator. It's called JPL Horizons. Um, and you can see that these, these are all the oppositions, how large Mars got. And it depends a lot because it's in a non-circular orbit, whether it's at perihelion or aphelion when we pass it. So the favorable uh, oppositions, it gets to almost 25 arc seconds. But what you really want to know from this is how often do you want to view Mars? And the answer is not real great because 15 arc seconds is a real small angle. You need 300 power to start showing detail. And it's only bigger than 15 arc seconds, 10 or 11% of the time. So it's not often at all. And so I like making this plot. Um, one of the imaging tools is to be able to image Phobos and Deimos going around Mars, which you absolutely cannot do with a single exposure. Um, 
So what I did was did the real long exposures, not that long, but long exposures to get Phobos and Deimos, and you see them moving in their orbit here, and then much shorter exposures, and then superimpose the two. These shorter exposures of Mars were made just a few minutes later, so it's kind of legit. And what you're seeing as this big halo and diffraction spikes is because Mars is just so grossly overexposed. And what's the factor of brightness difference, or what's the brightness factors between Mars, negative second magnitude, and Phobos and Deimos down at 13th and 14th magnitude? So factor, especially on Deimos, which is the farther out one, more favorably elongated, is a factor of a million in brightness. And we can do that with today's equipment, which is what's pretty cool. Um, so from Mars, that's what I wanted to show also, um, what would be the angular size of Phobos and Deimos? How big would they be? And so Phobos is about half the angular size of the full moon, quarter degree. And you see Deimos is actually quite small. Um, Jupiter and Saturn, just because we're working our way out in the solar system farther and farther, um, what are the top 10 things I've looked through a telescope and seen? Number one on the list will probably always be Shoemaker-Levy 9, 1994, a comet crashing into comet, it, it crashing into Jupiter. Um, seeing Jupiter and Saturn in the same field of view at 200 power is definitely on that list, probably in the top five. Up there with solar eclipses and everything for me, it was just spectacular. And, and then the image came out respectably good. I had to do a lot of boosting of brightness of Saturn um, because there's quite a mismatch in the, in the magnitudes of those two. Um, so it's sort of fake, but not really. Um, Saturn's rings have been doing this. So the most recent picture is only from what, a week ago or something. So very, or not even that, um, a few days ago, that's right. So a few mornings ago. Um, and you can see quite a bit of difference in sharpness, which is all due to seeing conditions, how stable the atmosphere is. <clears throat> um, but you can see what's happening is that they're closing up pretty rapidly. So you wanna know how often they're wide open and how often that they're edge on. Um, it's kind of a sine wave sort of behavior. So they're wide open for seven or eight years, but now as they pass through edge on, that'll only be a really brief period of time and then they'll open back up just a couple of years later. Um, so here's Saturn's rings. And what we do have to look forward to, everybody likes seeing Saturn's rings wide open. That's one of the most spectacular sites you can show anybody. But what we have to look forward to now are transits of uh, moons. And this is when I really didn't know what I was doing with the planetary camera in 2009 when it was near Edge on. There's Titan and that's Titan's moon, or sorry, it's Titan, Titan's shadow passing across the planet. Um, already, like a week ago, uh, Andy Casely in Australia has a nice image of a Tethys uh, going across the ring, going across actually the ball of Saturn. So it's happening already, and they're not even nearly at John. You got another year. <clears throat> um, just look around, and you'll find good illustrations for why the rings do what they do, why they appear at John or open over the 30 year orbit of Saturn. So just like I had to make a plot of Mars or what it's doing for angular size, this is what the inclination of Saturn's rings, do, what that does or the orbit. And here's where we are right now. Every time you go through an opposition, they open up slightly. So that's due to the Earth's orbit. Each one of these is a year apart about. Um, so they're really closed now and then they're going to go through edge on in a couple of years. But, you know, edge on is kind of depressing because you don't get to see the beauty of Saturn's rings. But there are other things you can look for during um, edge on period that's actually pretty interesting. Comets. Uh, basic comet anatomy is, here's as simple as it gets. Gas tail is the straight tail that always goes exactly away from the sun. And the dust tail um, is usually photographs as kind of orange. So you have an ion tail and then you have just the dust and that's not going to be exactly opposite of the sun. Here's Jennifer and me, west, uh, Jennifer and I are west of town, 50 miles, 60 miles, looking at uh, uh, comet Neowise in 2020. 
<clears throat> you can see the gas tail there, dust tail there. I was kind of curious, and I always have been, why is the dust tail, and it barely shows up in this image, why does it kind of curve off that way? And so here's the direction of the sun, and this is important, uh, here's the direction of its motion. So perfectly behind it, the direction of the sun is the ion tail, and then there's this thing happening. So as it's going this way, things will stream off of it. And here's a SOHO animation. That's a, a spacecraft imaging the sun with an occulting disk. And you see prominences in that. But watch what the comet does, a sun grazer comet. You'll see that same parabolic kind of shape. So what's happening makes sense. It's just a trajectory of the dust particles as it's moving downward are going to kind of fall off that way. So we see that in daytime experience all the time. And that just shows why it has that kind of curvature rather than just going straight back. And you can see it's not even pointed at the sun at this point because its velocity is so fast. <clears throat> not much to say on this other than um, when a comet is breaking up like Atlas was in 2019, it will almost completely lose its central concentration. Its cen central concentration. So the coma goes away and just becomes just kind of a core only. And that's a typical experience, uh, appearance of a comet that's, that's broken up or it's in the process of breaking up. Not long after I got set up in my observatory in the backyard in Tempe, um, this great comet Catalina came along. And there hasn't been one, including Neowise, that has shown tail streaming this well. So I stayed on an overexposed comet in this case. And I'm just showing how the streaming occurs back on the tail. Um, it's going three arc minutes per hour is what I measured. And so that's 80,000 miles per hour. So you can calculate that kind of stuff. Um, we very recently had the rare green comet, even though every comet is green, the press got a hold of rare green for some reason, and that's what it was called. Uh, ZTF was just uh, earlier this year. Um, what I liked about it is it had a very prominent anti-tail, and that's that thing. So the anti-tail is just like zodiacal light. We're gonna pass through this comets, uh, through the plane of the comet's orbital stream, and it's backlit by the sun, and you're just gonna see what effectively is the zodiacal light. It's the same type of phenomenon. I'm not going to dwell on this slide, sorry. All right, on to asteroids, my specialty. <clears throat> um, I'll skip by this. The only point of this, I was really proud of this. I followed this in the backyard for two months to get this, this asteroid's rotation period. Its light curve looks kind of messy, but goes all the way from October to December. This is the brightness of that comet or sorry, of that asteroid varying um, over a period of two months. So imagine something that's only 50 miles in diameter and it takes two months to rotate on its axis. So, and a lot of patience. Um, there's the DART spacecraft um, whose target was a companion of a nearby asteroid. So the asteroid was only 7 million miles away on September 26th and it was impacted by a spacecraft extremely successful mission. Nick Moskovitz talked about it here two months ago. But what I was proud of was that I used a mere four inch telescope on my backyard observatory. And um, you'll see the effect of the impact. So here's a, we'll start on the 25th, 26th, 27th. And it brightened that much because of the plume of material created by a spacecraft running into an asteroid which was so cool. And then everything that followed for the next three months was a great science experiment. And Nick did a bang up job talking about it. Speaking of Nick, um, on one of my nights where I was assigned to work at the 42 inch LO Observatory at Anderson Mesa, um, yeah, he had me uh, imaging these, this, this um, asteroid every one of the nights that I was there for three months. Um, and on one of the earlier nights, um, you can see the plume of material and this tail that persisted as long as we could observe the asteroid until it went behind the sun. So with the Lowell Discovery Telescope with four meters, they're observing the asteroids, the tail created by a spacecraft uh, five months later. So it's pretty cool. Um, 
I'll go past that one. One of the nights that I, my whole assignment for going there was nobody else wants to stay up till dawn. Um, so I would go there and I'd enjoy it, staying up till dawn and observing with the big telescope um, was observe Didymus every night, just stay on that one target. But on one night I got an email from Nick telling me, don't stay on Didymus, here's a near earth object, a near earth asteroid, and it's gonna impact somewhere in Ontario or in Lake Ontario two hours from now. And we only found it an hour and a half ago. Um, David Rankin at Catalina Observatory discovered this asteroid, determined an orbit and told, uh, told the world and people like Nick who get alerts for this told me and it was really challenging because it's moving so fast and the ephemeris is not that great. But this one is showing all the stars trailing in the background while this near earth asteroid uh, discovered by David down in on Mount Lemmon. Um, and two hours after this, it's a meteorite. And fortunately it just missed the land and landed almost along the shore of Lake Ontario. So they didn't recover fragments of it. Okay. Probably got to bring this a little faster. Talk a little bit of objects passing in front of other objects, eclipses. Uh, my favorite way to do a lunar eclipse photo is just to take this kind of thing like Akita Fuji did way back in the 1970s. That's the nicest presentation because it shows the Earth's shadow. So you'll see the diameter of the Earth's shadow and it's flanked by these two kind of crescents. There's the Earth's diameter out at the distance to the moon but the shadow is a converging cone. So we don't see the Earth's diameter, we see the shadow's diameter because the sun is not a point source. Get past that. Very recently, um, here's where Jennifer saved me. I went and uh, <laughs> so I had to play a double header hockey game this night that this was happening and I didn't want to miss it. So we set the 15 inch telescope out in the parking lot of the arena of the rink that I play in and Jennifer monitored it and hit the record button at the right time and did everything such that we got the moon or we got Mars uh, passing behind the moon. But the rule of thumb from this slide, just a little another thing to look at on images and things to know is that the moon moves its own, moves not its own distance, it moves its own diameter every hour and then you can re reduce that all the way down to it moving one arc second every two, arc, two seconds of time. So that tells you how long is it gonna take Mars to pass behind uh, the moon? And the answer is gonna be 14 arc seconds times two, about a half a minute. Mercury transit, this was a real favorable transit. Um, and not only did we get the Mercury transit, but since I'm doing single stack with my hydrogen alpha filter, it shows the thickness of the chromosphere real well. Um, and that's the chromosphere. It's only several thousand miles um, across. And you'll see speculoes, that's these little mini prominences, just so much to look at. Okay, I'll get into the last section of the talk and I think I'm gonna get this done in five minutes or so. And it's the deep sky. <clears throat> so we determine the distance to stars, the easiest way has always been parallax, where you just say, here's the Earth um, in March, here's the Earth in September, look at the same star, and it appears to change position if it's nearby. How much it changes position is real easy math to back out how many light years away, or how many parsecs away that star is. Well, one th cool thing was that the New Horizons program people took a image of a nearby star, Wolf 359, but rather than having the Earth's orbit as your baseline, New Horizons was out by Pluto. So now you got this huge baseline and then they took an image and encouraged amateurs to take an image. So the distance to the star is about eight light years. So just at the Earth's orbit, we're only gonna shift it by half an arc second, but now we're gonna have this huge baseline and it's gonna be 16 arc seconds and here's parallax. So there's me and New Horizons observing the same star and the parallax is huge. So it's pretty cool. And you definitely don't get anything like that if you just use the Earth's orbit. Um, proper motion kind of along the same lines, but not parallax. This is a nearby star that's also moving 
physically moving fast and it's nearby called Barnard Star, my favorite chart in Burnham's Celestial Handbook, which I started this hobby in 1977 and tried to view it a couple years later. Notice this little V-shaped asterism, and that's from my image right there. And there's Barnard Star. So if we animate that and the time counters down here, here's what I've been doing every year. Just go out, and it's a routine picture. We just gotta remember to take it every year. And it's showing the, mark, the motion of Barnard Star. The discovery is great by E. Barnard. So I went all the way back to the images that E. Barnard used to discover it, which were from 1894 and 1916, and then superimposed my image. I know this is hard to look at, but there's the V, and here it is way up here. So in our lifetime, um, Barnard star will move almost a half a degree. But if you take your vitamins and everything, maybe it'll be at one degree or so. All right. Um, PV Cephei is a variable star that also has a variable nebula. As always, the time counters down here go into uh, 2022, I guess it ends, yeah. So we had this nice reflection nebula that you could actually look at with a, with a 10 inch telescope. And what's happened is it's almost completely disappeared. You can see these exposures are about the same length and the variable star faded, actually has brightened up a bit in this last frame, but the nebula around it is no longer visible because of dust that's in the immediate vicinity of that variable star that's moving around, it's swirling around the star. A much better example that's really worth a look in any telescope and worth an image is uh, Hubble's variable nebula. And this is just over a real short period of time. Um, I talked to this club, to EVAC, about doing long-term time lapse, so I won't dwell on it too much. But if you really look closely, you'll see that the uh, right uh, veil nebula component and the left one, 6960 and 6992, they're, they're diverging in these two images. So that's from 1953. And the supernova remnant is expanding. So what you have on the west side is moving to the right and the east side is moving slightly to the left between those two frames. And I did a lot of that. And the one that I liked the most probably was the Helix Nebula, which you can see dug up an image from 1914, 101 years later, you can see the expansion of the Helix Nebula. What you can also see is the motion of the Helix Nebula because I registered on the central star and everything's shifting back and forth because it's also moving across our line of sight as it expands. So it's expanding at about 90,000 miles per hour. Um, rather than presenting a color image, here's monochrome images or grayscale images through various filters. So blue filter, uh, red filter, infrared filter, and then hydrogen alpha, which is just a narrow, narrow band pass. So in blue, we're seeing a lot of the nebula. As we go out to infrared, you see a lot of stars. Those are stars that are shining through the nebula for the same reason that you see the sunset as red. The longer wavelengths get right through that. And that's always gonna be the case in those types of images. <clears throat> I did the same thing with the dumbbell nebula through various filters went red, infrared, it's almost completely disappeared, and then hydrogen alpha. So I know pretty pictures in color are great, but to me, that's just the way my brain works. I just find this way more interesting than color pictures. Um, last couple slides, here's one, there's all, they're all over the place. Um, variable stars in M3, the ones that are marked in red you know, are brightening and as the ones that are marked in blue are fading. So globular stars have all these old stars. Many of them are unstable. Our, our Lyrae stars that vary with really short periods and over just several hours, it shows these variable stars all over the globular cluster. It's really cool. Um, Milky Way is an edge on galaxy. Richard Payne over there has a print that that kills this one that he took uh, made a mosaic of a bunch of images that he took from Namibia just a month ago or so of the Milky Way straight overhead. And I was telling Richard that this is 
for me, uh, this and northern lights are more spectacular than a total solar eclipse, just because you get to study them longer, you get to see them longer, and, and they just etch in my brain. So the, the southern Milky Way from a southern site overhead center of the Milky Way is just amazing. And it's an edge on galaxy, just like these. So it's just a backyard project, uh, 15 flat galaxies is what they're called. There's, a, there's actually a flat galaxy catalog um, by this guy, this Russian guy, um, Grunchnitov. And, um, and not only is there a flat galaxy catalog, there's even just like the Flat Earth Society, there's a flat galaxy society. So wake up sheeple, the galaxy is flat. So, okay, all right. Um, Andromeda galaxy, moving outward, and then we moved back to the local group, oh well. Um, is uh, has a star cluster or actually a stellar association called NGC 206 in it. And what I wanted to know was if you put the sun out in that stellar association, all of these stars are about magnitude 17, 18 maybe. If you put the sun out there, it's magnitude 29. It's, it's thousands of times fainter. Um, and now we're out to the galaxy level way out. Here's two supernovae that have happened in the last three years. So baseline image, one supernova. This one is still quite visible. These are called the Siamese twin galaxies. And you can see three to two different supernovae, which is great. So again, move that to the distance of a kind of far star, a distant star, Rigel, and it's as bright as a full moon. So these supernovae are extremely bright. And I'll end, our end, sorry, um, with this image of M65 and M66. Um, they're 65, sorry, they're 66. And what I wanna show here is, if you look up at the sky, you can see down to a magnitude six or so, 6.5, maybe if you have a really dark sky and good eyes. So this is kind of like a bottle of the Milky Way 90% of those stars are in that dot, are, are in that small part. So we're not getting anything like a full view of our galaxy. We're just kidding. We're just seeing when we look naked eye, just the extreme local neighborhood. And it's all the bright superstars of that local neighborhood. Sunlight stars would be extremely faint. Um, and then everything else that we see in the Milky Way is just a glow. And that's where you have to use binoculars and telescopes to see far away. Um, so sorry I went so long. Um, here's uh, resources on this. And if you have stupid or smart questions, you may ask them now. Thanks, thanks for listening so long and not, and not falling asleep. Uh, questions for Tom? Rick? Comments? Oh. What's up for? Oh, so Rick, Rick Scott here is asking for Deimos and Phobos if I used an occulting bar, which means at the, you know, at the focal plane, you want to put like a little strip that will exactly block the diameter of Mars. No, I didn't. And that's why there's a big kind of nebulosity that you see that big, that big glow and diffraction spikes. So ideally, if you want to see Phobos and Deimos, right, you block out, you block out Mars, which you can use like a piece of aluminum foil or something, right, uh, and that'll Black out Mars. Oh. Oh, yeah. So anybody who anybody who wasn't here two months ago for Nick's talk, yeah, Jennifer is saying that the whole point of of smashing and uh, spacecraft into a, the binary companion of an asteroid was to see if you could deflect it. And the way you could see if you could deflect it, it's in orbit around an asteroid. And if you hit it head on, um, both the impact and the debris plume, mostly the debris plume, is going to slow that companion down, move it to a more inner orbit. So instead of taking 11 hours and 56 minutes to orbit, now it takes 11, about 11 and a half hours or 11 hours, 24 minutes to orbit. So now you know how much you deflected the the asteroid. So when we have the killer asteroid come toward us, we got a little bit better idea than we used to have about our ability to deflect an asteroid. Questions? Yeah. Uh, 
questions, comments for Tom? Loud clapping for oh, Tom. Right. <laughs> Looks like we're running out of battery on this one. Uh, so thank you. Uh, we'll see you next month. Uh, if you can help put chairs away, please make sure you're putting them in the right orientation. Uh, there are going to be some folks who are going to Union Bar and Grill. This is on Higley and baseline it's north of uh, baseline uh, behind the dairy queen so if you guys need a nightcap uh, otherwise we'll see you next month thanks guys <laughs>